I'd like to welcome uh, everyone to the Engaging Students with Online uh, Breakout Room Groups activity, uh, Activities Workshop. Now this workshop deviates somewhat from the typical break, uh, breakout groups workshop that I've done in the past. Normally the focus would be on creating and using breakout room, groups or rooms uh, within the context of Blackboard Collaborate. However, uh, in this revised version, I'm going to be speaking a bit more broadly encompassing other web conferencing platforms such as uh, Zoom and Microsoft Teams as well as uh, Collaborate and that's really because we have an increasing number of faculty who are now relying on alternatives to Collaborate which is fine. Now while I'll be talking uh, about the technology a bit uh, I want to spend just as much time talking about pedagogical, uh, pedagogical considerations when working with breakout groups so it's not so much a workshop on the mechanics of creating breakout uh, rooms or groups as much as it is on creating breakout room and group activities. So uh, you probably you know have heard me say this a few times I'm, I'm referring to to these uh, items as groups and rooms and that's because depending on the platform that we're using they will re refer to them as either one or the other. So from this point forward I think I'll just refer to them as breakout rooms. All right. Now I'd like to also make a further distinction between this workshop and one conducted by my colleague Amanda Smothers earlier in the week facilitating group work uh, online. Now her focus was on group work generally uh, in either an asynchronous or synchronous setting where there is an established group or team who are collaborating on a project. My focus is on the synchronous sessions where group activity takes place during a live session between two or more students in a breakout room. Uh, for a certain purpose. Now these student per, uh, uh, pairings could be between students who have been assigned to work on a semester-long project. However, it's also likely that the pairing is only temporary with students not even having previously interacted with each other. My name is Dan Cabrera, your presenter for today. I'm the multimedia coordinator and also the part-time online teaching coordinator. I'm sharing that responsibility with my colleagues Amanda Smothers. Um, and my uh, primary focus is on teaching technology uh, and pedagogy uh, to faculty. Um, and in fact, I always see it as, as kind of a, uh, an unfair advantage for me because I get to test a lot of these technologies in the in the courses that I teach with the College of Health and Human Sciences. And so uh, sometimes I, you know, I'll try something and it'll be a smashing success and other times it'll, it'll land like a dull thud. Uh, but I get to actually do it with live classes, my own classes, classes that I've taught for a number of years and that I continue to evolve. And I should mention that there, there's never a point in your career where your class is perfect. It should always seek to get a little bit better every time you offer it, whether that's face-to-face -face or online. So in today's workshop, uh, we have a number of things that we want to get through. I'll be describing the purpose and the function of a breakout uh, group or room. Uh, we'll be discussing the pedagogical rationale and benefits for incorporating uh, these breakout group or group uh, uh, room activities. I'll list the four main steps involved in the application of breakout groups along with issues. These are issues to consider uh, um, with breakout groups. Preparation, so, so important and a little bit of pedagogy. Um, also be comparing the web conferencing tools I had mentioned earlier Microsoft Teams and Zoom as well as Blackboard Collaborate. And then I'll give some examples of breakout group activities. So I figured since uh, this is a workshop a little bit about, about breakout groups, breakout rooms, uh, I'm going to have you guys engage in a little activity. Okay. So what I'm going to do is, is break you up. Let's see, I've got uh, to, to do to do. Hey, look at that. <laughs> Thank you, Catherine. Appreciate it. Um, let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I've got eight people. So I'm going to have, uh, I'm going to make four groups. I'm going to put you into groups. I'm going to just randomly assign you in uh, as, you know, two people per group. And I want you to discuss with each other uh, what is the purpose or function of group activities. Now, this is just group activities. It could be face-to-face -face or online. So if you if you can talk with your speak with your uh, partner if you don't have a, a microphone then just uh, use the chat area 
So once you're once you're in the session, you'll be able to either type out or turn on your microphone and and then just talk with each other. So what is the function or purpose that you guys think of uh, of a group activity? And then also, what are some of the benefits of this type of activity? So after about, let me see, I'm going to give you guys two minutes once we get started. So it's not a lot of time. Um, I want you to come back and, and then just report. Uh, and what I want you to do is I want you to share what your partner has said. Okay? So you'll have to listen closely to what they say as well as uh, what you're saying. All right. So let me just stop this. Uh, slide right now. I'm going to go to breakout groups. I am going to randomly assign you to. Let me just see. I'm gonna have. Four groups. And then once we get started, you'll get two minutes. All right. Here we go.
Hello, everyone. I hope you guys got my message. I, I, I sent it out to you um, using the uh, just the regular chat feature to everyone so that everyone should have gotten it. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that feature as well and how it compares in Blackboard Collaborate with some of the other, uh, other um, uh, web conferencing tools. Okay, let me just start up the, um, let's see, the presentation again. I know that I, that I had you come in there and that we actually uh, already began the breakout rooms. So uh, I'd like you to, to uh, just do a little debrief uh, and I won't ask on, on everyone and every in, in the group like that. But uh, if somebody wants to uh, volunteer, there is a little, little person on the bottom center of the screen. It looks like somebody's raising their hand. If you could do that and then share, that would be fantastic. Come on, we'll go. Okay, Marsha. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll go here. So I was with Greg. Greg te teaches in the College of Ed, and I teach in the School of Health Studies. Yay. So what Greg said was that students are more likely to respond in small groups. That was one of the benefits of doing a group right. activity. Uh, it's a, for some, it's a more safer environment. They can say things that they're not quite comfortable seeing in a large group. Uh, perhaps they just don't. They don't feel comfortable talking in front of a large group of people yet. So excellent, excellent. That's a that's a great one. As a matter of fact, that's something that I have in in my own notes. So good for you, Greg. Thank mm -hmm. you so much, Marsha. Anyone else? Maybe just one other person from a different group. Okay, here we got here. Let's see. We have. Let's see, Justin says, Davian said that he thinks the purpose of group work allows students to apply their knowledge and with others to achieve a shared academic goal. That's a great definition. Thank you, Davian. And thank you so much, Justin. All right, let's, let's, let's move on. Thank you all for engaging in this, uh, in this activity. Let's see. So um, now group work, uh, uh, work, it can be an excellent way to engage students in an online course. Now, when it's effectively implemented, and that's really the caveat, it has to be effectively in implemented. Students working in groups or teams really can foster critical thinking and dynamic interaction in an online environment. Now, in our traditional face-to-face -face courses, instructors can break students into small groups and then have them collaborate on assigned tasks. And this provides students uh, opportunities to work together mm -hmm. to promote the critical thinking in the discussions and to encourage social interaction and then gain insight from their fellow students as they collaborate to solve their problems. Now, students can then return to the larger classroom and share their findings. Well, this same benefit can be experienced by online students using web conferencing tools such as Blackboard Collaborate, Zoom, and Microsoft Teams. And uh, as they all pretty much provide a breakout room feature, which is what you guys just experienced. Now, creating meaningful connections, and that's so important, can be difficult in larger group settings. Breakout rooms allow organizers, uh, organizers to divide the meetings into subgroups to facilitate discussions and brainstorming sessions. I think you guys have identified that, that um, I think Greg in particular, that students are much more likely to talk in smaller groups uh, and it's a little bit more intimate, I think. Okay, let's see, here we go. So, breakout groups have many of the same features as the main room um, they're used to facilitate the small group uh, collaboration. They're used to challenge students and allow them to work together in addressing questions. A moderator or anyone who runs a session, uh, probably the instructor, can create groups and place session and, uh, and attendees and students into specific breakout groups. And they also, and the moderator, has the ability to move around groups to engage with students when they're working in groups. Now, some of you guys, I actually you know announced myself others seem to be deep in conversation and I dare not stop the flow so I didn't say anything uh, now I guess it's we can all recognize this it kind of sort of can be perceived as creepy <laughs> to have someone just just looking in that's like a neighbor looking in through your window uh, not a cool thing so one of the things that I wanted to point out is is that when you sort of uh, you know, say that this activity is going to take place, really give them as much information about it as possible, including the likelihood that you will see, uh, they will see you 
when you come into the session. Otherwise, it, it might be like that creepy neighbor. <laughs> uh, anyway, okay. Now, to facilitate small group collaboration, you have to create breakout groups or rooms that are really separate from the main room and assign participants to them too. And there's a, I was going to say, there's an approach to it. It's, it's, it's part art, it's part science in, in terms of how you do that. Breakout groups also have their own private audio and video and, and whiteboard application sharing and chats. Everything that we have in here, only now you are the presenter, you have more access to that, that information. So any collaboration that takes place in a group is really independent of the main group. And there are some, there's an upside to that and then there's some, maybe one downside, we'll talk about that in, in a few minutes. Okay, so what is said and viewed in blackout rooms will not be captured in a session recording with limited exception. Okay, and I'll make that, ex I'll tell you about what that is too. All right, so um, the four steps, how we, how we break down breakout groups is that, and, and, and the way I want you to sort of conceptualize it is that we plan our collaborat collaborative activities. This is all part of preparation before any session gets started. In fact, well before any session gets started. It's something that you start building into an upcoming session. Uh, so there's a lot of forethought, a lot of planning uh, involved, not just the fact that you will have it, but what form it'll take. Uh, then students will have to log into the web conferencing uh, tool that you're using, which could be uh, Collaborate or one of the others. Then you have to create breakout groups, assign students and run the activities with a limited exception, and I will tell you what that is <laughs> also in a few minutes. Uh, let's see. And then at the very end, you'll be um, ending the breakout groups, and you'll ask students to debrief, which is also an important component of this of this activity. Okay. So, uh, breakout groups are designed for group collaboration, as I mentioned, and that everyone in the group is a presenter. And this means that all uh, all participants they can share a whiteboard. They can they can they can annotate on that whiteboard. They can sh uh, uh, well well at least in Blackboard Collaborate they can share files. Um, in Zoom and uh, Microsoft Teams they can still sh uh, share some something. Uh, what it is is sharing screen so they can share what they have on their computers. And um, if they're running an application they can share that with the rest of their team as well or their group as well. Now, content that's shared in a breakout group is really not available when breakout groups end. Now, consider suggesting that participants record their or document their collaboration in some way. So they might want to take a screen capture of anything that they've shared and collaborate it on. Okay. Uh, also, it might be a good idea to have in the group uh, a designated series of, of roles uh, in the part, and of course, it depends on how many people you have in the group too. We'll come back to what different roles that people can play, but the one I want to just sort of highlight right now is designating someone to be the scribe, to take notes, either in Microsoft uh, Word or any any you know uh, any tool that you can write anything down, or in PowerPoint. Okay. So. In, I'm not sure whether everyone has had the opportunity to actually run breakout groups, but I want to identify some considerations, some issues that people need to be aware of uh, when they are, I guess, beginning the ideas of starting to, to uh, incorporate this in their teaching. So what are some of the issues? Well, uh, first of all, you want to ask yourself, what is the purpose of the synchronous breakout room session? So say you have a face-to-face -face class that's no longer meeting face-to-face, -face, you're online, um, and then maybe in your class you did have these breakout sessions, you know, where you would have people go to different parts of the classroom, maybe even have a few people outside the classroom, uh, groups, and work on something. So there needs to be a purpose, and not only that, but it needs to be clearly identified. It needs to be, you need to be very explicit on what the purpose is so that it answers the question for the students. Why am I doing this activity? You know, what's so special about it? Why is it necessary? Is it just busy work? And, and you as instructors, as faculty members, always know you never want students to have the sense that something is busy work. It always serves to, to advance a, a certain level of skill or knowledge uh, in there. Also, is there a connection, uh, this activity, to a module or course level learning objective? 
um, and it, does it have value? Is it important? Um, uh, everyone should have learning objectives every week when they're when they're teaching something. Specifically, uh, objectives for a lesson or a uh, maybe there's a week worth of, worth of content, and all of that supports course level objectives, which is a, a little bit more broader. Um, I, I like to say that it's not not that it's that it's vague, but it's less specific than the module level objectives. And so, any learning activity that you engage in should you, should be used should align with the objectives as well, ultimately as as the learning materials themselves and the assessments that are used to measure success. Um, is it an appropriate tool to use, a synchronous tool? Because there are there are a number of different synchronous tools. Is this the ideal tool? Is this the perfect tool? There's nothing worse than, than having a great tool, but not appropriate for how you want to use it. That's kind of a waste. Um, and, and sometimes if, it, if there isn't a really good fit with the tool and the activity, um, the activity you know, is at risk for, for failure. And so you want to make sure that you are comfortable with using the tool, but that it's also the right tool to use. Now, how does this learning activity fit within the total course? Is it worth the time investment from a live session? Uh, and what possible benefits to, uh, to students are derived? So you really need to consider all of that too. As I mentioned, a specific activity, a breakout room uh, activity, uh, serves to, uh, to, to provide assistance or support for a you know, module level objective. And so do you have just one activity in the uh, synchronous session? Or is it a series of breakout rooms, uh, breakout group activities that you have, uh, that you're engaged in it? And what possible benefit to students are they going to be gaining from this? Uh, is the activity used to support higher order learning or lower or, or order skills? Now, this is really important too. I, I would say that probably by itself, um, any activity really isn't going to, because you're not spending a, a lot of time in these things, usually it's during the, the course of a session, you're not spending a lot of time in there. However, if you're taking this one activity in the context of other activities, which may include additional uh, breakout room activities, but also activities that, that are asynchronous, that happen outside the, the live session, maybe there's an asynchronous um, series of tools that you're using for students to work on a project, then they will uh, support higher order learning. Uh, like I said, once again, depending on how you design it and how you orchestrate its utilization. Will students have access to the appropriate technology to participate? And that's the uh, and, and accessibility in, in, in terms of the uh, available technology and accessibility. Uh, you know, are you are you using a, a, a tool that actually makes it easy for people to connect? Uh, one of the things that always concerns me is the use of um, Wi-Fi versus uh, Ethernet connection. And you as the instructors, I will always recommend this if anyone's doing anything online. If you are the moderator or the instructor, you want to use the uh, um, an Ethernet connection. Or at the very least, if you have a Wi-Fi, make sure that your device, your unit, your computer, is right by that router. Uh, there's nothing more embarrassing than, than losing connection in the middle of a of a sentence, <laughs> and I've had that happen before. All right, so you want to make sure that you you are aware of what your students have and uh, and are able to do. Sometimes it requires you uh, modifying an activity. Maybe it, be, it does become an asynchronous uh, activity, but you want to make sure that the students are not going to fail because of lacking their the appropriate technology. What are the roles of the moderator or the instructor? Uh, well, I mean, you as the uh, that that moderator or instructor really need to do, to keep in mind certain things. You need to facilitate student activities. You need to uh, monitor the groups, as it was demonstrated when I when I jumped into your sessions. You may want to provide uh, a name to breakout groups. I know when I, when I just did this automatically, this was sort of uh, an automatic assignment. It just automatically names it group one, group two, group three. But you may want to identify, especially if it's associated with a, an ongoing uh, series of activities and, and, and actually genuine groups or teams that have formed outside of the session. So I have uh, some some group activities and, and my, my uh, the names I've given them uh, team beneficence, you know, team non-malfeasance, team veracity. These things provide a sense of identity for the project that they're working on and, and the groups. So this is more long-term and, and this is, uh, so it's not just a one-time 
off thing, you know, where people will do this, you know, by working with someone they never worked with before. And as was demonstrated in our session just a few minutes ago, you guys are working with someone who you may not be familiar with. Okay, so once again, you want to you want to be able to uh, you know be aware of, of how you're using these groups. You want to be able to move uh, the uh, participants into different groups if that's appropriate, and you're, of course yourself. And of course, you want to be able to end the, br the breakout groups in a way that's a little less jolting. Maybe you, you let people know, hey, we're going to be ending our groups in just a few minutes, or in a minute, or right now. Uh, and I like to always end my, my breakout groups with a little bit of a debrief. Uh, what went on in, in the group activity? What were the results? What, what products do you have to show for the time spent in there? So that students know that, that what they were working on really was valued. Okay. So let's talk about those important steps in um, – you know, or, or I guess uh, this is the second the second uh, uh, item that's really important in developing uh, uh, these group activities, the breakout group activities or, or breakout room activities, is preparing and prepping for a session or, or activities. Now, do you want to create a breakout room in a session? Um, do you want to do you want to plan it in advance? Okay. Um, and this is important too. Sometimes people do it on the fly. Like today was planned. I knew that I was going to do it like this, but I didn't know for sure how many people were going to come. If there was uh, th three people, well then it would be. I might just have a one group. In fact, I might even have a breakout group because it wouldn't have. You know, it doesn't really make sense to have uh, a small amount of people in just one group. There, if, if there were multiple people, then that would be fine. Uh, and today we were lucky. We had uh, eight or nine people who are in the session, so it was easy to, to, to do that. Um, you want to ask yourself, how does this activity fit with the total course? Uh, why am I using this activity versus something else, another type of activity? And so as we talked about the, the, the importance, the value, the purpose of uh, a breakout room activities, you know, is to be able to, to get people to, to work together, to, to collaborate, uh, to engage not just with the content, but also maybe some a little bit of social interaction, because we're now living in the time of COVID, we don't see each other uh, face to face uh, anymore. I mean, it's just it's kind of a rare thing, and so this activity actually, in addition to uh, supporting development of skills and knowledge, also an opportunity to say hi to our to our our colleagues. Okay. Um, is the activity really tied to a module level objective? Or you're just doing it just for the sake of it, um, which is not, you know, I mean, not to say that it's totally bad, but it's important. You know, you want to be able to maximize your time. And so, yes, whatever I'm doing right here really needs to be supportive of my overall objectives. Is this a one-time activity or is it a consistent pattern activity, which you have at least once every time you meet? Or you may have multiple times where you're using the breakout rooms during the regularly scheduled synchronous session. Uh, maybe you chunk out material or content in a way that it's it's meant to lead up to an activity like this where students can dis uh, discuss content that was just mentioned. Uh, is there any preparatory materials that students need to have uh, to review in advance? Uh, so maybe there's some assigned readings that you want them to, do, to have done. So when they come into the live session, the synchronous session, they'll expect to be able to work with somebody else. But if they are not prepared for it, then it's going to be really bad. All right, and sometimes, sometimes you'll have an activity that that is not going to ask them to to read something in advance, but you always want to make sure that that decision is in, a decision is made before the session even begins. You want to decide how to design the learning activity that's based on the stated purpose, the module level objectives, and the material used. In other words, we're looking to have an alignment of all these things. They should be supportive of uh, of each other. They are not random activities. They are not unrelated to uh, other aspects of the course. They should be supportive. And is there a reason to manually assign students to rooms, or can they be randomly assigned? In the uh, activity that we did, we uh, actually it doesn't, doesn't really matter, uh, you know, who gets assigned with with who else. So that was fine with me. But if I had a course that I was teaching, and maybe I had my group. Uh, non-malfeasance in my group veracity. I want those people to work together. What I would want to do is I'd have to make sure that those people go into a certain group, and I might even spend time 
creating that group, changing the name and all that stuff. However, unfortunately for uh, most of these tools, uh, you can't really do that in advance. I mean, they're, okay, well, one of the three you, you really can't do yet, and that would be Blackboard Collaborate. The other two, uh, there are, there are, I guess, workarounds that, you, that will allow you to do it in advance, to pre-assign groups, which is really kind of ideal. Okay. Now, you, you as the instructor want to think about, am I going to circulate? So, you know, uh, when people go into their sessions, do you want to leave the main room and then pop into the breakout rooms? It's, it's, it's the virtual version of circulating in your classroom to check on small groups. So now these check-ins really allow you to, to ask qual uh, clarifying questions, you know, that people can ask you, well, what did you really mean by such and such? Or build on a student's ideas uh, and observe what's going on. So if someone is saying this and, uh, and uh, a student is, is, is sharing some ideas and they're going in the right direction, you want to encourage that. If they're not, then you might want to stop and have a slight intervention to be able to maybe change the direction just a bit. Um, you also can send messages. Uh, so in, in your planning, you want to say, okay, am I going to be sending a message? Most of the time, you want to have that, that opportunity uh, because when, when students or when uh, teachers facilitate small groups in physical locations, in brick and mortar classrooms, they often display a, a visual timer or a reminder of how much time students have. So you can send a message from the main room to all breakout rooms to keep your students on task, share directions, or maybe add uh, other helpful reminders. Uh, this is also possible for a student to send an, an, uh, a message to you and says, hey, you know, I'm in group three and we have some questions. If I'm in the main room, I will see that. And I'll be able to jump into that room to to help the students, and this is all. This is really kind of sort of a way of recreating what you would have in the classroom, or maybe you know a physical classroom. Somebody raises their hand, and I look and I say, "Oh, you know, I see that you know a person in group three is has a question." So you can also do that. Uh, another thing is to poll for feedback, uh, because working in breakout rooms is it may be new to students. You want to use the polling feature to gather students' feedback once everyone is back in the main room. So if you plan to use breakout rooms in a regular way, it's important to find out if students' experience was like so you know that if you need to make any adjustments or supports that you need to put into place. You don't want to have people going into the same situation which they did not like the first time for whatever reason, and, and if there's a way to, to modify that to improve that based on feedback, that's what you want to do. So now let's talk a little bit about pedagogy, okay? Now, say you've decided to offer synchronous uh, class sessions with your students, um, but how are you going to make them lively or engaging or interactive or even worthwhile? You know, simply transferring what you do on the land-based in-person classrooms to the, to the virtual platform, it's just not possible. Video conferencing tools and platforms such as Collaborate, Zoom, and Microsoft Teams they really are a promising medium. They can transform an online class into an active learning community. So to fully use the possibilities these tools offer, you really need to consider the specifics of this medium and intentionally redesign the content and learning activities that match it. Okay, that's according to Hirsch, 2020. And the students have reported feeling more motivated when asked to directly participate in synchronous remote uh, sessions. And as Greg had mentioned, many students are more comfortable engaging online in a smaller group than in front of the whole group. So it's not just about intellectual engagement with the, with the course content, which is important, but human engagement between students with each other or students with a faculty member. So if you consistently put students into groups, you have to recognize that there's going to be a certain expectation. Students will expect to do this type of activities. And they'll benefit from direct interactions with their peers in small groups. For instance, um, in Zoom breakout rooms, students have a small group discussion. They can apply concepts. They can analyze a case or a situation, solve a problem. A consistent structure really reduces students' cognitive load. It frees them up to engage with what matters most. It's the content. Now here's some uh, tips for helping structure effective small group activities. So you might want to give students a task. So you want to, for instance, you might ask them to identify the pros and cons of a, a particular issue. 
you want to ask them to apply concepts from the course text or a pre-recorded lecture or analyze a, a case or a situation or solve a problem. So that's an example of, of, of a task that you might ask them. You also might want to assign rotating roles. I met, mentioned earlier that one of the things that makes it a little bit easier to facilitate the flow of activity is to, give us, uh, is to assign students specific roles and if they recognize that that's what they're going to be doing, they're going to be focused on that rather than just sitting there and maybe passively listening to what's going on. They, they know that they, they are, they're supposed to actively engage in some particular responsibility. So a discussion facilitator who initiates the small group uh, or discussion, you want to keep the, keep the group on track whereas a note taker will be recording what's going and documenting what's going on, a timekeeper to say, hey, we've got two more minutes left, and maybe a reporter if that's necessary. So that person will be uh, reporting on what was said in the session. Um, so these are all important roles, and, and students now have a better idea of it uh, being a valued, important uh, activity uh, that's not just busy work. You might want to use a protocol. So you introduce students to discussion or small group uh, work protocol. For example, you might want to tell them to do a circle of voices first, maybe going on with each student sharing a thought or an idea or a comment before opening up the discussion. So now they have a plan on how to proceed in the, in the session. Uh, you might want to use a note catcher. So you ask your students to use a collaborative note catcher that you created for a small group discussion. Uh, you, want, might, you might want to check, and this is part of what you're, you're going to be expected to, to do, check in with the groups like I, like I did. You want to monitor the note catcher and, and check in with uh, those groups that are not taking any notes. All right, That note catcher activity is really important. That's the person who writes everything down that's happening that is relevant to the discussion. Uh, now, maybe a group is stuck and maybe they're so engaged that they're forgetting to take notes. So one of the things that you want to do is, as you're in the session, you says, is somebody uh, writing these down? You know, who's, who's responsible for taking the notes down? Once again, once they've done it a few times, they'll know that that's the expectation and uh, that's less likely to be dropped, especially knowing that the note catcher is, is collecting all this information and the reporter needs that. So the note catcher really is, has an obligation to do that. Uh, then you might want to broadcast announcements to the breakout room. So you're just informing students about any remaining time left for the activity and when the breakout rooms will close. Once again, we, we don't want to have it completely unexpected. First of all, to go and knowing that maybe they have five minutes. There is a someone who is looking at the clock when they're in there. And then you may send a, you may broadcast a message saying, hey, we'll be, we'll be closing down in about a minute. Um, and then you might want to ask students to reflect before you close the session. Okay, now these are a great way to have students reflect on a class session while uh, also providing the, you with a valuable feedback. So many of these can be adapted for online use, such as using the chat or having students complete a brief online survey before leaving the session. What did you learn from this activity? What did you learn from the session as a whole, but specifically the breakout group activity? Now, before you put students into breakout rooms, you want to explain to them uh, that that how you'll use them. I, I've mentioned this earlier, but I, it's so important. I really want to be a little bit redundant here. You want to talk about how you're going to use these breakout groups or breakout rooms. And more importantly, you want to explain why you will use them. You want to show them perhaps maybe a short video that explains how the rooms work. You want to model the process. I model the process when we started our session today, do you guys have a, a better idea of what can, uh, what they're like? In, in the case that you may not have ever had that experience, you want to be creating meaningful connections, which can be difficult in larger group settings, but breakout, group, uh, breakout uh, rooms, they really allow you to divide the meeting into subgroups to facilitate discussions and brainstorming sessions. Um, so you're using the uh, small group uh, collaboration activity to improve these connections, a the sense of, of connections. You want to provide a sense of immediacy and even a sense, maybe a little bit of, of intimacy with these activities because we are not, we're now all online. We're working remotely. We're teaching remotely. We may not see our students. In fact, uh, I, I think I've seen maybe a student face-to-face -face, 
maybe once in the last two or three years that I've been teaching. I usually teach in the fall semester a couple of couple of uh, classes. And so I expect not to be able to see the students in a face-to-face -face environment. And so with students who have busy lives, they have other, other considerations and other obligations, in addition to taking classes, may never see their students, uh, their fellow students in a face-to-face -face setting. So providing this opportunity for them to, even if it's just one other person in the session, or maybe it might be two or three other persons in the breakout rooms, they at least have some sense of, of connection. There are other ways to establish a sense of community. Uh, this is just one of those great tools that, that allow you to do that. So you as the instructor, as the moderator, you really need to see your role as one that facilitates the student activity and really provides them a meaningful and significant experience on a regular basis, okay? So also, I mean, students get so used to working online that, that the fact that it's online isn't, isn't so much uh, as important, um, you know, as the fact that they're working. In fact, it may be that it's transparent. It doesn't even come up that it's not a barrier, that students working online can do this successfully, can do this uh, consistently with their, with their colleagues. So these uh, team of group members are using the, the synchronous session as a time or a place to establish a sense of trust. Um, and it's not something, they don't have to do everything in a particular synchronous session. Once again, when the session is over, there may be a, a series of other things that are working on that are asynchronously um, uh, structured for the course. Uh, but this is an important component of that. It's not just synchronous activity. It's a synchronous activity when artistically or scientifically orchestrated or structured makes the course very, very engaging. Okay. So, um, it's important to lower the stakes also when you're introducing a, a new tool. You want to establish a routine where students know that breakout rooms are going to be a consistent part of learning. So you may start slowly, maybe that first live session, you may have just one breakout group uh, activity. And then maybe you might want to increase that in, in the following weeks, maybe to two or three, depending on how you, how you chunk out your, your content within a live session. But now students are not overwhelmed with this, this technology. They have no way, you know, or, you know, they're not familiar with doing it. So making it very easy uh, and maybe taking it slow so that students now learning how to do this successfully. Okay. So there, there really is a need to debrief after the experience, as I mentioned earlier. Students need to know that what they're doing has a purpose. And if you just have them engage in the activity, but there's no debrief, what did you learn? What happened? What are you bringing back to the main room as a result of this activity, this experience? Then they will get the idea that it's just wasteful. Maybe they'll, they'll talk about the weather, or maybe they'll talk about next year's Bears team, or whatever, all right? You want to make sure that they are debriefing about the experience. Uh, you may also want to consider have them doing a reflection of their experience. Maybe after the, 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 the session, say, I want you uh, to have this little low stakes uh, assignment where you're providing a reflection of what did you learn from today's session? Not just the breakout room, but also the, 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 uh, the synchronous session. What did we, what we talked about today? Um, was there anything that you felt uh, was lacking? Um, something you would like to see more of? Or continuing what we're doing already? So this is a great opportunity, once again, to involve the students to make sure also that they're involved in the course, that they're not just sitting there passively. You want to use breakout room activities to challenge your students, okay? So you want to allow students to be able to work together in addressing questions or issues or problems. And one of the best ways of doing that in a live session is these breakout group activities. Now, you as the instructor, once again, you want to facilitate these activities, really need to move around to engage with the students while they are working in their groups. Okay. Uh, let's see. I want to take just take a second here to ask, are there any questions so far in our discussion about breakout group or breakout room activities? Questions? Okay. You guys can still hear me, right? Hello. All right. Thank you so much. I appreciate that.
Davian and, and Greg. Okay. Everyone. Oh, okay. Hey, <laughs> thumbs up. Very nice. Okay, so I'm going to do some comparisons of the various tools, and like I say, this is kind of a, for us, it's it's kind of a new thing. But in, in a, several years ago, we had two primary group web uh, web conferencing tools, uh, which is Collaborate and and Connect, Adobe Connect. And, and, and Adobe Connect really sort of has lessened in demand. Uh, I, I think maybe it's, it's maybe one department that relies on it still, which is fine. Uh, but these other tools that have become available are now becoming more in demand, and of course I'm, I'm you know in, I'm referring to Zoom, and um, and Microsoft Teams, which is which is great. Zoom, uh, we just I guess recently signed a contract with Zoom. I think it, for students, I mean we, we as, as a faculty and staff were able to use it to some degree. Students as authenticated users became uh, part of that uh, of this universe. <laughs> Uh, I think in January 25th, and so now we can use, we can have uh, them use this this great technology, uh, and then uh, Microsoft Teams uh, had the I guess the Teams meeting have this new feature of breakout groups beginning I believe in late December. So it's relatively recent. That's why we're we're, we're having this <laughs> workshop today to discuss that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the features in Collaborate. And I'm going to I'm going to do comparison uh, with all of these uh, tools. So if you guys have any questions about that, now once again this is not a workshop on the mechanics of using Zoom or, or Microsoft Teams, but it's just a comparison of what their capability is. So let's look at Collaborate first. Uh, one of the nice things I see about Collaborate is its integration with Blackboard. It's not something that's separate. It's not external. It's not something you have to look for. So it's just all part of uh, part of the the whole, I guess, uh, interface with Blackboard. Um, one of the the what some people might see as a limitation is that in the main room we have maybe a limit of three to four video tiles, and so we can see if we if if we all turned on our uh, video cameras uh, in this session. Not that I'm asking you guys to do that, but if we did that, then there would be uh, maybe a maximum of three or four that we could see at one time. So there is a limit, it's a, and it's really based uh, not just on the browser. Some browsers will allow more than others, uh, but I think it maxes out at maybe five. Uh, but it's also a limitation of the uh, Blackboard Collaborate, uh, I guess, technology. Now you join uh, the sessions through the Blackboard Collaborate scheduler page within a course. In our case, I send you out a link and you came in like this. It doesn't know who you are, uh, so you had to had to put your name in. You had to type your name in. Now, uh, if you if your students are coming in through the course, it will automatically identify them because they're coming in through the course and they've already logged in. Uh, you cannot pre-assign students to groups, which is kind of unfortunate, which, uh, kind of sad. However, I think that is on the um, the roadmap. Uh, so if you create groups in your course, like I have my, my team non-malfeasance and veracity, um, and, and, and so in the future, I'll be able to have those people uh, come into the live synchronous session, and I'll be able to do breakout groups uh, with those specific groups and, and people. Uh, but right now, that's not possible. Now you can assign students to breakout rooms manually or randomly. Uh, if it's manually and you have a large group, it probably is, is too onerous to be able to do that unless you have a GA who, who, while you're talking, will start assigning people to certain groups. They'll create the groups and, and do that. Um, but like in today's case right here, there was no real reason for me to manually put people with specific uh, groups. So I just used the random feature, which is the quick and dirty. I don't like using that word, but I guess I'll have to. Um, now. Uh, these uh, breakout rooms or groups have all of the features of the main room. I've mentioned that before. You can upload content. You can like uh, PowerPoints or PDFs or images. Uh, but you, you can also use a share application screen, uh, another great feature. As instructors can push out content to each breakout room, uh, either all at the same time or individual material to, to certain groups. They can send out messages to breakout rooms, and breakout rooms can also send out a request for assistance from where they are using the chat feature. Uh, now, the recording does not recur in the breakout rooms. It only happens in the main room. So while you guys were in your sessions at the start of our, of our workshop, uh, there was nothing being recorded uh, at the time. Okay. 
Now, one of the unfortunate things is once you come out of the breakout rooms, you can't reopen breakout groups. They're once they're once they're closed, that's gone. I would have to rely on. Uh, <laughs> I'd have to manually put people into the same groups to match that. That is a known limitation. I'm the first to admit that. So, if you say I like the you know I like this activity for this first activity, uh, breakout group activity. Now I want to do it again. Uh, you're going to have to somehow know who was in what group, and and that can once again, like I say, it's a little bit onerous. All right, so let's look at Zoom. Um, it has a partial integration with Blackboard and within the within the interface right here. You can you can create a meeting, and then you can share the meeting ID and the password from a Blackboard course, uh, but don't use the link because if you use the link, um, they students will not be co coming in as authenticated users. It's a link you can share with anybody, and so instead of doing that, you want to provide them with a um, uh, the meeting ID and a password. All right, and you, you want to ask your students to access their um, the the Zoom session through either the app, which they'll install on their device, or using the NIU Zoom login, and, and just just Google NIU and Zoom, and it'll take you right to that that particular page, um, and they can just um, log in there, or they can use the they can download and and, and use the the app, the Zoom app. There's a maximum viewer view, that's the viewer titles, in a student gallery of 25 or 50 uh, people, okay? So depending on the size of your, of your work, of your online course. You can join the Zoom uh, portal, as I mentioned, uh, Zoom session using the Zoom portal or the desktop, desktop app. Um, you can, now supposedly you're supposed to be able to pre-assign students to breakout groups, however, it doesn't seem to be a consistent now. It's not consistently working. It's a little, a little frustrating. Before it didn't work because students were using the link and they weren't authenticated. Well, now because we we have uh, we have that contract starting on January 25th, they are authenticated. But there is a glitch that's happened recently with an update. So I would not rely on on, on this uh, pre-assigned feature uh, because it uh, it may not work, which means that you'd have to assign people once you're in the session. Uh, but you can, you know, still use the manual or random assignment uh, feature also available in Zoom. Um, breakout rooms have all of the features of the main room, uh, just like uh, Collaborate does. Um, you can, however, you can't upload files to Zoom, uh, unlike Collaborate, which means you just have to share your screen, which is not really a problem. You know, you just just make sure you have what you want to share open. And so when you use this feature right here, you just select that thing you want to share. And sometimes it's your PowerPoint presentation, which is running on your computer, and, and that's what you're doing. Um, let's see. You, you might want to suggest perhaps providing uh, content in a Google Doc for groups to work on simultaneously. So that you have a Google Doc and have the students adding content to that while they're in the session. Okay, so somebody is in there working away and, and, and everyone is looking at the uh, at the document using the the shared screen uh, uh, feature you can push out a broadcast message to breakout groups I think it's a little bit more ele elegant um, in zoom than it is in uh, collaborate now this is the difference uh, between zoom and collaborate if you have a recording it follows the host into the breakout rooms and so here I am. First thing I did was to, to was to visit in today's session group one. If if I had if I was using Zoom and I went into group one, I would be it would be recording whatever happened there. Okay. Now but that's if the host records locally. When you when you are in Zoom, you can you you can record to your computer or you can record in the cloud. Okay. So if, if the host records locally, when the students go to the breakout groups, the recording will follow the host only. If the instructor or the uh, the host records in the cloud, that will not happen. Okay. So let's see. Another thing is that you can reopen breakout groups after closing them. So unlike Collaborate, if you have a great you know, session, you come back in, you debrief, you, you talk some more, uh, maybe more lecture, and then you go back in, you can get those people, the exact same people to go in the exact same group. That is a big uh, plus as far as I'm concerned. Okay, let's see. All right, any questions about Zoom?
it's a great uh, feature. A lot of people use it for business. Other people use it for personal uh, interactions, which is great. Okay, let's move on to Microsoft Teams. One of the nice things about Microsoft Teams is that it's integrated in the NIU community. This is what we're using a lot. In fact, in, 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 in uh, Center for in uh, Innovative Teaching and Learning, we're using it for so many, every meeting that we have, we use Microsoft Teams. It is great. One of the things that has been turned on uh, recently is auto transcription, uh, which means that, that whatever you're saying is being transcribed automatically, which is fantastic. Now, I'm not going to uh, uh, claim what its accuracy is. I don't know that. I don't know if it uses punctuations or capitalizations and all that stuff, but it is a great feature. Um, and also, you want to you want to expand the uh, accessibility of this particular uh, unit or this particular uh, technology. Now, in uh, Blackboard Collaborate, you you know you can have a feature. It's not an auto transcription. You actually have to have a a person come in and to do the transcription. Usually, you get that through the Disability Resource Center. Uh, but this is really a great uh, a a great addition to uh, the the technology in terms of expanding. Uh, accessibility. Now, the maximum viewer view in Student Gallery is 25 up to 50. Uh, so you can actually see if you have a large uh, student cl uh, class, up to 50 people, you can see their videos. So they all have video cameras. However, it's going to be really kind of small. And so it's, you know, the more you have, the less uh, real estate you have to be able to see that. So it, it does have some value, but, you know, it, it's sort of a qualified value. Um, you want to join by creating a Microsoft Teams meeting, and then you want to share that particular meeting in Blackboard. Maybe you want to share the link in Blackboard in some content area. So although you can't really pre-assign students to breakout groups, you can create team channels, and then you can add students to each of these channels. And so you might have a, a, a channel for team veracity or, or team non-malfeasance, whatever. Make sure that you've added those students to that. And then when you when you have your live session, say, okay, at this point, I want you to go to that your team channel and 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 talk with each other about this this problem or whatever, and then come back to the main session. Okay. I think that's that's a great feature. You can assign students to breakout groups manually or uh, randomly. Also, uh, you have breakout rooms that have all the features at the main room. Once again, uh, one, and and also like Zoom, you can't really upload files, uh, so you have to share your screen uh, in Microsoft Teams. Um, once again, I suggest you might want to consider ha having students use a Google Doc for that. Uh, they can work on it simultaneously. You can also push out a broadcast message to breakout groups. And the recording does not occur in the breakout rooms. Okay, I'm going to skip over some of this other stuff here because we're almost done. Any questions up to this point? Uh, I'm not seeing any. So I'm going to go really quickly, uh, give a couple of examples. This is, uh, this is something you might want to consider doing in a breakout room uh, session. This is called Think Pair Share. I'm sure everyone has heard about doing this. This is an active learning strategy. It involves posing a short problem, uh, a scenario, or question to your students and then giving them the time and the opportunity to complete the following steps. They want to think through a problem or a scenario, a question individually. And then they want to pair with a partner to discuss. So you would be putting people into, into these breakout groups. And then you want to have them share their findings or takeaways with the rest of the class after working in the session and give them a certain amount of time to do that. Now, this student not only gives your students time to process and apply their knowledge and skills uh, on their own at first, but it also gives them the opportunity to consult and collaborate with a peer. This process usually elicits more thoughtful responses while lowering the stakes of sharing with the rest of the class because they can get it out with one or two people. Okay, let's see. And in this case right here, I've, I've got uh, – uh, this actually was a video. I just took a screen capture of it. This is an Astronomy 201, uh, uh, 210 uh, uh, class. This is um, in Cuesta College. They're using flashcards in a peer instruction. This is Think, Pair, Share. It's an interactive learning environment. Uh, instructor sees feedback from students' responses to multiple choice questions. If the responses are only 30 to 70 percent correct, then the students are given about a minute to explain to a neighbor student, neighboring students why they chose their response before responding with flashcards again. Uh, and, and actually, there was, there's a really cool video on, on this activity taking place. Okay. And then um, 
let's see. Great. Looks like a response. Yes, that's what we call them in the field of educate. That's exactly what they are. But they're using that in uh, in conjunction or collaboration with a think pair share activity. Okay. Let me see what we got here. I think I've got one more line. Small group discussion and reporting out. So think about your groups ahead of time. You want to randomly assign students to groups of a particular size. Only want to. You may manually assign them. If you have discussion board groups or group projects, you can assign the same groups for breakout groups, uh, breakout rooms. Now, it can be nice to keep the groups consistent for a few sessions so that students get to know one another. Um, groups of about five tend to be a nice size. You, you want the group to be small enough that it's easy to jump from into a conversation, but big enough that if there are any different ideas or perspectives, even if there's someone uh, when someone has technical dif uh, difficulties or steps away from the computer, it doesn't shut it down. Now, when students go into the breakout rooms, they won't be able to see your slides anymore. If there's a particular question you want them to be discussing, you want to have, have those available on a Canvas site or a shared uh, Google document uh, once again. Now, that, that's probably going to be the case for, um, for Zoom and Microsoft Teams, but you in uh, uh, Blackboard Collaborate, you can actually push out content to them so they can continue to, to read the information that you have. Okay. All right. Next, actually, we, we've reached uh, the end of our time. I don't want to keep you any longer, but I ask one more time, do you have any questions? Okay. Marsha, Davion, Greg, Justin, Cassandra, any questions? Doesn't look like it right now. So, okay, Marsha. Thanks, Greg. Okay, back to the breakout rooms and collaborate. Uh, you said they were all presenters. And so that means I assume that we don't have to make them presenters like you do when they are presenting a, a PowerPoint. Exactly. Okay, mm -hmm. that's automatically an assumption. Yes, yes, breakout rooms, because okay. that's the only way they, they can be able to function, to share content, you know, to, right. okay. to have a discussion with each, mother, uh, with each other, and then just upload content if they need to. So, yeah, no, it's, it's a great feature. It's not something, well, I mean, all of them have this automatic presenter thing. They have the same features. Um, so, um, yeah, it's, it, it, it's, it's great to be able to do that. Uh, otherwise... You'd, it, there would be this this awkward workflow where the instructor would have to go into each each one and uh, each breakout group and then assign them this status or this role, change their status like that. Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Marsha. That's a great question. Other questions? Okay. Well, I'm not seeing that coming up right now, which is fine. I'm going to send you this PowerPoint slide presentation. I'm also going to send you links to some research uh, or some uh, resources that I found on that are very instructive and helpful in this particular area. I want to thank you all for coming to today's session. I, I appreciate your, your uh, involvement, your engagement, your contribution to today's session, and I want to wish you good luck. Keep your eyes open for any new workshops uh, that you may have an interest in. Take care. You're welcome, Marsha. Thank you, Greg. I appreciate your contributions as well.